So we left off even odd properties. So now we're going to talk about types of functions. So we're going to just name a whole lot of types of functions. So we'll start out linear. A lot of you want to use mx plus b, so I'll use that letter so you're happy, mx plus b. All right, there is linear. Uh, what about a, now a constant function, I didn't write that down, but a constant function would be basically no x's, just a number in there. Uh, so we got linear, a power function. Power function. will just look like uh, x to the n, so some positive integer n times uh, number a. So there's a power function, polynomial. So one way to think about a polynomial is basically the sum of power functions. So it's a bunch of power functions added together, which we'll write as a n x to the n plus a n minus one, x to the n minus one, plus dot, 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 a one x plus a zero. Now three dots means continue the pattern. So what is the pattern? If you've written three dots, the pattern should be obvious on your paper. So basically just keep decreasing the power, uh, the n minus one, n minus one, decrease the n minus two as you go over and over and over until you get to a1 x to the first, a0 x to the zero power right there. But you don't have to write the zero power down. So there's polynomial rational. <coughs> don't need to write the word function or rational function. It'll be a polynomial over another polynomial. So one polynomial divided by another polynomial. Or a ratio of polynomials, which is where the word comes from. And algebraic. basically rational functions with fractional powers. So last quarter, a lot of you took pre-calculus two class. What type of functions did we look at? They're not on this list that I've made so far. All the trig functions. That's the next type. So that'll be things like sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent, and all those fun functions. All right, a few more types. Exponential logarithmic. Good news is we're not going to do those until Calc 2. So exponential logarithmic functions exist, but we're not going to do them until Calculus 2. So we'll write them down and then cross them out. However you spell logarithmic. So that is next quarter. Uh, it turns out I cannot even tell you what an exponential function is until I tell you what a logarithm is. And I can't tell you what a logarithm is until you know about integration. So you are quite a ways away from knowing logarithms at this moment, even though you know a lot of properties about them already. All right, combining functions. So that is 1.2. So that's our next section.
So when I finish this section, we just finished 1.1. That is an uh, indication to you to do your homework for 1.1. So you should be starting your homework when I finish the section. And the idea with the pop quizzes, I just finished 1.1. So I could ask you a 1.1 or give you a 1.1 quiz two days after I finish 1.1. So today's Friday, so Monday will be one day after I finish. Tuesday would be two days after I finished. So on Tuesday, you could have a 1.1 quiz. So that means you want to do as much 1.1 homeworks as you can over today and over the weekend. And any last questions you have, you ask them on Canvas. And hopefully you can get them all finished by Monday afternoon. So by the time Tuesday morning rolls around, you're ready for any type of quiz questions similar to those homeworks. All right, combining functions, we'll go with sum and difference first. So if you see two functions being added together, f plus g of x, what we really mean is 2f of x and g of x separately and add them together. Same thing with minus. And products, I will never use this notation because it's going to look a lot like function composition notation. The only difference is that little dot becomes a little circle, which could be very easily confused. So that's f times g and the last one f over g of x. Now you have to be a little bit careful about domains here. <coughs> Most of them are the intersection of the domains of f and the domain of g. So this on the right makes sense as long as x is in the domain of f and the domain of g. Then it would make sense to plug it in. Uh, same is true for all four of these. You have to be a little extra careful. The last one, not only does x have to be in the domain of g, but g of x better not be 0 also. So anytime you divide, you want to be a little bit careful and make sure uh, this is going to be equal when uh, g of x is not 0. All right, composing functions. This is something we're going to do quite a bit. So if we write it down as f of g of x. So this little symbol right here is a small circle, not a dot. It's probably not obvious. Let me make that a little bit bigger of a circle so it's more clear. So it should be a small circle raised up. So I call these cannibal functions. Is one function eating another function? So instead of just eating x's, is actually eating a function. So there's a few ways to think about this. So g actually goes first and f goes second. So you have some x hanging out over here. Now, pre-calculus one class, we look very carefully about function composition and when the domain and the range don't match up in the middle. So you d take x and whatever g does to that, it's going to end up being some number. The problem is that number, maybe it is inside, uh, maybe it's not in the domain of f, and maybe it is in the domain of f. So to be a little careful to make sure the output for g is a valid input for f when we do function composition. So it's very technical, so I'm not going to go over all of the uh, rules of function composition and domains, but just be aware uh, not every output for g uh -oh, is a valid input for f. So that is function composition. Yeah, I can try to write the domain quickly. 
So domain of f of g is all x in the domain of g such that g of x is in the domain of f. So it's everything in the domain of g, but you have to be restricted a little more to make sure that all those g of x's are in the domain of f. And I haven't talked about the backwards symbol, this little e symbol right here. So that means is an element of. So this says all x which come from the domain of g. Or all x's that are elements of the domain of g. So we'll do our first example from this section. <coughs> so we're going to let f of x equals square root x and g of x equal x plus 1. So let's find uh, f of g of x. So I want to find f of g of x and the domain. All right, so f of g of x is usually better to write as f of g of x in this notation. So you see f on the outside, g on the inside. Now you can plug in either one first. I like to go work on the inside first and then kind of work my way out. So what is g of x? I'm using this g of x is 1 plus x right here. So g of x is 1 plus x or x plus 1. So f is really inputting x plus 1. What does f do to the input? All it does is square roots. So it takes the input and square roots it. So there is f of g of x. Now if that's hard to see what I just did. That function uh, composition. You can do something a little bit silly. You can feed f a box. So what happens if f eats a box? It does square root of the box. So all I did was put x plus 1 inside the box right there. So nothing more than that. You just got to treat the input the way F treated it originally. So take the input, square root it. All right, so that's the formula. So we got that. How about the domain? How do I get domain of a square root? What do I have to worry about with domains? Can't be negative. So I want to make sure it's zero or more. So domain. So domain of a square root, the uh, input can't be negative. So I'm going to take the input, which is x plus 1, and then set up an inequality and say that has to be 0 or more. So I want to know when is x plus 1 more than 0 or greater than or equal to 0. So easy algebra to solve, subtract 1, negative 1 less than or equal to x. So number line here is negative 1. Do I want numbers to the right of negative 1 or to the left of negative 1? 
I should say to the right of negative one. So that'll be, I want everything over here. And now I have to decide, do I want to use, is it okay to use negative one or do I skip it? So it's okay to use it. So I'm gonna go square bracket at negative one and you always go open over at infinity. So you got infinity right here. So our answer for domain uh, f of g, so square bracket, negative 1, and comma, infinity. You're always going to use open parentheses at infinity, or negative infinity. All right, so that's the domain of f of g. All right, now we're going to do uh, graphing. We'll do the easy part of graphing, which is shifts. So we'll do vertical, horizontal shifts first, and then we'll do stretches second. Vertical, so if your function is a function you know, and then you add a number to it, it's going to be a vertical shift. So if you have some function and you just add k to it, this is going to be a vertical shift. And let me, I'm going to use y, or uh, instead of y, I'm going to write g of x. So G is the graph of F shifted up K. So you know what the graph of F looks like. You just take it and shift it up K units, and that'll be your graph of G. Horizontal. you're still going to add, or in this case subtract, <coughs> so this one, vertical, you know it's vertical because you're adding outside the function, and you know it's horizontal because you're basically adding to x itself, or subtracting. So g is the graph of f shifted now it looks like we're subtracting h, so I should go negative, but horizontal is always the opposite of what it looks like. So in this case, we're going to shift right h. So all the horizontals, if it looks like it's a subtraction, it's actually going in the uh, positive direction. And if it's neg it looks like it's negative, you're actually going in the, or if it's positive, we're going in the negative direction, negative, we're going in the positive direction. Do you have a question? Everything you do in those brackets basically is the opposite. Opposite what it looks like, yeah. Vertical, horizontal. All right, so we're going to graph an example right now. So we're going to graph our base function, f of x is square root of x. All right, how do you graph a function you're not familiar with? Plot points. So we call that the clueless method. So if you don't know what to do, you can plot points. You may be doing that for years and been clueless for years, and that's fine. Uh, if you took pre-calculus, you already know what the graph of square root x looks like, so you don't need to use the clueless method. Still make sure your points are accurate. So if I'm going to go clueless method, I have to be uh, 0 or more for my x value. And what's the next good x value to use? Two's not great. 
So I could do 2 and 3, square root 3, but 4, square root is 2. So I would just skip the 2 and the 3 and just go right to 4. So plot that out. All right, there's the square root function. The points I really care about, I'll make them bold right there, those three points. So I could label them 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2. All right, so that's our base function. Let's do some transformations. All right, horizontal or vertical shift on this square root x plus 3? Horizontal. horizontal. So I'm definitely going 3. Do I go 3 to the right or 3 to the left? Right. So I'm going to go in the negative direction, which is, which way is left? That way is left. So we're going to go 3 to the left. So one way to do it, just think about your x coordinates were 0, 1, and 4. Just take them and move them. Uh, to the left. So if you're a visual person, do that. If you're not a visual person, just subtract 3 off each of those numbers. And go ahead and redraw that graph right now. So you should start at negative 3, and then your biggest x value that we used was positive 1. So just shift them all left 3, and that should be your graph. All right, our next shift, square root x minus 4. So you pronounce this almost exactly the same, but this problem is very different. What type of a shift is this minus 4? Vertical. So if it was inside the square root, it would be horizontal, but it is not inside the square root. So this one is going to be 4 downwards. So this is going to be a shift. So this first one is a left 3. This one is down 4. So take your original graph your original square root graph and shift it down 4. So just think of those three y values and then bring them down 4. Now, a lot of times graphs can be deceiving. It looks like there may not be an x-intercept on this graph. But if you remember all the square root graphs, they keep going up forever. So there's no maximum y value. So you're going to pass through 0 and all the bigger y values. <coughs> all right, so what's after stretches when it comes to graphing? Compression, Compression and, oh, I did, did I say stretch? I meant shift. So there's stretches or compressions after shifts, uh, also known as scaling. Scaling. Uh, we're going to take our C to be greater than. No. Just make sure C is not equal to 0.
Oop, we'll do vertical first. Horizontal is a tricky one. We'll save that for the end. All right, so first thing you notice, scaling. Instead of addition, scaling is multiplication. So you're going to multiply. That's the big difference between all your scaling and all your shifting. So scaling is multiplying. So the graph of G is the graph of F stretched or scaled vertically by C. And the way I write this is I write the number C and I do a vertical like double arrow. Now scaling is a lot harder to see than shifting. Shifting is kind of easy. You don't have to distort things. You just slide them up, down, left, or right. But when it comes to scaling, they actually get distorted. So you have to think of your graph as um, being on maybe like a sheet of, uh, I don't know. I always say silly putty, but it doesn't exist anymore. No. I'm too old. You know silly putty? So if you stretch it, it deforms the shape that's on there. Um, that compression doesn't work with silly putty, it just turns back into a ball. So compression doesn't really work, but you can stretch it out. Alright, so that'll be scaling vertical, now horizontal. It is very similar, except you're going to be multiplying by C right next to X. Now your book writes it like this, so we'll go with that notation. So it'll be 1 divided by C times X. Actually, let's not go the way your book goes. I don't think I taught it this way. So we'll go C times X. So the graph of G is the graph of F scaled horizontally by now everything is backwards so it looks like you should if C is 2 for example maybe it gets twice as wide everything is opposite so it looks like you're multiplying by 2 you're actually going to compress it half as big so you're going to scale horizontally by the reciprocal so don't multiply by C, think about unmultiplying by C or dividing by C. Yeah, so in either case, if C is negative, you don't just get your stretch or your, your scale, but it will flip it as well. So when C is less than zero, you also get a reflection. Now, why was I careful to say that C was not zero? What happens in a vertical scaling if C is zero? It'll crush it down to basically the x-axis, so it's very boring. Uh, horizontal is even worse. Uh, technically, if you put zero in there, uh, you would also have a constant function as well. So it breaks down. It doesn't work with zero, scaling of by zero.